I think we just uh, start. So <clears throat> thanks to all of you for uh, joining us today at this uh, uh, webinar. It's, we call it the CCUS Hub in Conversation webinar. And we are thrilled today to have two experts join us. And the topic is, um, we will be looking particularly today at how the um, US Department of Energy is scaling up CCUS and carbon removals. Coming out of the uh, Pittsburgh event and the climate the week in New York, all of us would have seen the uh, implications of the uh, US IRA and I think everybody's very impressed by what's happening in the US. And it's going to be a very important set of, you know, inspiration frames for the industry to work on CCUS going forward. So I think we're very fortunate to have uh, Jennifer Wilcox with us today and also Jared Daniels. I can think of two, no two more experts to take us through this. My name is Bjorn Otis Fabrup. I'm the chair of the executive committee of OGCI. And um, I'd just like to say to you, Jared, uh, hand it over to you and why don't you guide us through this uh, webinar. And thanks to both of you and thanks for all of the nearly 100 people joining us already. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bjornado. And, and let me add my welcome to the, the first CCUS uh, Hub webinar as, as well. Um, we've got a, a great hour uh, in store here in terms of uh, just a quick introduction from myself, a uh, presentation from Dr. Jen Wilcox for 15 or 20 minutes, followed up by a, a nice discussion. We'll have plenty of time uh, for audience Q&A as well, and we'll end promptly on the, the hour. So as, as Bjorn Otto mentioned, uh, again, I'm Jared Daniels. I'm the CEO of the Global CCS Institute, and we're one of OGCI's partners on the CCS Hub platform. I'm, I'm excited and delighted to be uh, with you here today and with Dr. Jen Wilcox to, to have a conversation on CCS and the tremendous work that, that she and all of her colleagues at the U.S. Department of Energy have been leading as part of the Biden administration's focus on, on climate change mitigation broadly. Just yesterday, the Institute released our global status report of 2022, which highlights the current status of CCS globally. It's available um, free to all on our website to download. I invite you to download a copy um, if it would be of value to you, and then we'll put that um, address in, in the chat function here. I'd just like to provide just a quick summary to help set the scene um, for our discussion here today with, with Dr. Wilcox. Globally, it's been an exciting year for CCS. Our report finds that in the past 12 months, the CO2 capacity of all the CCS facilities under development has grown to uh, 244 million tons per annum, uh, which is an impressive growth of 44% um, year on year. Today, globally, there are, are 30 commercial operating CCS facilities around the world, capturing over 40 uh, million metric tons per annum. And the pipeline of commercial facilities is stronger than ever. There are currently 11 facilities in construction and 153 in various stages of development. Much of this growth has occurred in the United States where there are currently 13 operating facilities. And this growth is clearly driven and supported by very strong government policies, durable regulations, and significant existing infrastructure uh, that these projects can leverage as well. At high level, and this is contained in our status report we just, just uh, released, there's some key trends globally in terms of this accelerating uh, deployment of CCS that we see, and we've noted in our report. And I'd just like to highlight those, again, just to set the scene for today's discussion. Clearly, government efforts in numerous countries um, toward establishing effective regulatory environments and uh, incentivizing CCS deployment um, that has driven a lot of the momentum and a lot of the growth that we've seen. And we'll hear some great examples from Jen in terms of the U.S. government leadership to help drive CCS deployment. In addition to that government role, we've seen industry models that support capital investment. And, you know, growing focus on CCS hubs and networks, and much of this is being supported and informed by OGCI's works on hubs and networks in collaboration um, they have with many, many partners around the world. We've also seen increased interest in the financial sector to incorporate CCS in their investment strategies, in ESG considerations, and green taxonomies. The level of engagement between the CCS community and the broader financial community is growing quickly. Um, there's still much more work we need to have um, with the financial community to ensure that CCS is an appropriate part of that broader sustainable finance conversation 
consistent with all the climate math, it shows CCS as a, an essential part in the overall solution to mitigating climate change. There's also been unprecedented engagement in direct air capture with CCS or DAX, with billions of dollars in funding allocated to scale up this essential technology. And I'm sure we'll hear more on that topic um, from Jen as well. Globally, we've seen increasing efforts to progress clean hydrogen broadly um, and other low carbon fuels with dozens of blue hydrogen projects now in development around the world. And you know, from my perspective as a, as a chemical engineer, it's important to take a holistic systems approach, um, perform appropriate life cycle analysis for all these various approaches. And I imagine Jen will have some things to say about the hydrogen efforts in the United States as well and how all those various pieces fit together. And globally, we've also noticed a trend toward closer regional cooperation on, on, and collaboration on CCS, uh, particularly surrounding some transboundary storage activities, for example, around the North Sea and countries working together there, um, perhaps shipping CO2 and having hubs and clusters, countries working together in developing Southeast Asia. So at high level, those are some of the trends that we've seen. Again, they're available in the report that's, that's free to download from our website. Um, we've seen great progress this past year um, and you know, much demand for CCS is being driven by net zero commitments, both from governments and the private sector which is good news for CCS and it's, it's good news for climate change mitigation efforts overall. But having said that, you know, global efforts to reduce emissions, including investment in CCS, are still grossly inadequate. Although the increasing deployment of CCS we see is encouraging, we're still far short of the scale required to achieve and help achieve net zero. The installed capacity of CCS still needs to increase by at least 100 fold between now and 2050 to help meet our climate goals. This is a Herculean challenge, but it's achievable if we all work together. Reaching the required scale for CCS will require government action, the governments to put in place supportive policies. The private sector and industry is going to need to build, own, and operate these CCS facilities at relevant scale. And the financial sector is gonna to need to come together um, to help provide the capital required um, for, for this capital intensive equipment. We clearly all need to work together to do this at commercial scale now, as we continue to advance the technologies through learning by doing and as academia and industry and all of our fine research institutions continue to innovate and continue to advance uh, the technologies. These, these really need to be on parallel paths. We need to begin um, this deployment, accelerate this deployment with the technologies that are available now. We all have a role to play. I am honored to be here today with Dr. Jen Wilcox to discuss um, her role and DOE's leading role to advance CCS deployment, both domestically in the United States and globally working with all of the DOE's international partners. So with that as hopefully setting the scene in the, in, in the context, I'd like to introduce Jen Wilcox and then hand the, the, the conversation over to her for her presentation. Jen is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management at the U.S. Department of Energy. She is currently on leave uh, from a presidential distinguished professorship at chemical engineering and energy policy at the University of Pennsylvania. I am a firm believer that we are all products of our upbringing and our environment. And, and Jen, having grown up in rural Maine, um, has a profound respect and appreciation for nature. And, and that's really driven her focus on environmental issues throughout her career. For example, as a senior fellow at the World Resource Institute, um, she led WRI's carbon removal program. Dr. Wilcox has a PhD in chemical engineering, uh, an MA in chemistry, uh, a BA in mathematics. Her research takes her at the, at the nexus of energy and the environment, developing both mitigation and adaptation strategies to help minimize negative climate impacts associated with our dependence um, on, on fossil fuels. She's uh, served on various committees, including the National Academy of Science and the American Physical Society to assess carbon capture methods and impacts on climate. She's also the author of the first textbook on carbon capture, entitled Carbon Capture, which was published um, a decade ago in March of 2012. She's co-edited the CDR primer on carbon dioxide removal uh, in 2021, and that, that resource can be uh, found online. So with that as an introduction, it's an absolute pleasure to, to welcome Jen here today, to provide her presentation. Um, again, after that, we'll have a nice, healthy discussion. We will have plenty of time for uh, Q&A. Um, there is a Q&A channel here on, on the Zoom platform, um, so please send those questions our way and we'll get started. So with that, Jen, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Jared, and uh, thanks for everybody for being here uh, today. And you can see my slides, okay? All right. Yes. Awesome. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Department of Energy, what we're doing, uh, and also the role of carbon management in achieving our net zero greenhouse gas emissions goals. So I wanted to start out to kind of set the stage uh, when we think about, and Jared has mentioned this already, the critical role uh, in the tool that we will need in order to achieve net zero, both carbon capture, but also carbon removal. And so this is um, a report that came out of the White House and the Biden administration. And as you know, uh, the United States has a goal of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. And so when we look at all of the areas that we have to have impact in, in terms of decarbonizing the electricity um, grid, uh, energy transitions, non-CO2 reductions, uh, the land sink, um, all of these different aspects we need to be able to target and recognizing that there are really hard to decarbonize sectors and that we will need CO2 removal from the accumulated pool of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, to help to counterbalance truly hard to decarbonize sectors. And that carbon removal shouldn't be seen as a tool to offset emissions that we actually have the ability to avoid today. Uh, in terms of carbon capture, it's true that it's a tool that we can use for the electric power sector, um, natural gas-fired power plants, coal-fired power plants, but it's also a critical tool for industrial sectors as well. So when we think about cement, for instance, uh, there's not a lot of good options in terms of really deep decarbonization of cement. And when you think about cement, it's a combination of a chemical reaction where we calcine limestone, and so that chemical reaction produces CO2, and those are called process emissions, but it's combined with fuel. Uh, emissions as well. And so in the case of retrofitting a cement plant with carbon capture, you achieve deep reduction, reduction of not just the process emissions, but also the combustion emissions. And so carbon capture is a critical tool for some of the industrial sectors for committed power infrastructure, um, but it's a different tool from carbon removal. And U.S. long-term climate strategy shows um, that we will ultimately need both of these tools in order to achieve net zero. The Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, and so this is the, the office that I'm engaged with and working in, um, in Department of Energy. We recently went under a reorganization that actually it's been a year since September, and we added two critical words to the name of our office, carbon management. And so recognizing that when we think about fossil energy, we think about fossil fuels, there's emissions associated with how we extract them out of the earth, and we need to mitigate those greenhouse gas emissions like methane, for instance, associated with fossil fuel production, but then also how we use fossil fuels, uh, whether it's for power generation, whether it's a fuel for manufacturing um, or transportation, we also need to recognize that there's the pollution associated with how we use fossil fuels. And so managing carbon is a significant component. And as we also look at the administration and the goals that have been set forth um, from the perspective of climate, we went through the reorganization to think about how can we prioritize our investments such that they are aligned with all of these, these goals. The first one being 50% emissions reduction by 2030, CO2 emissions free power sector by 2035, and then as I mentioned already, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. So we took a deep dive uh, within our office and thought about how are we dependent on fossil fuels today? The most complicated is natural gas. Uh, we use natural gas not just for power, but commercial and residential heat, which is more di distributed and difficult to decarbonize. Uh, we also use it for industrial heat. I mentioned cement earlier, but also steel production and a number of other industries. Um, when we look at oil, our dependence is mostly associated with the transportation sector. In terms of our investments in FECM, some of the work that we're doing in that space is, is looking at uh, using CO2 as a chemical feedstock when combined with clean hydrogen to produce synthetic fuels and chemicals to help offset our dependence on crude oil for the transportation sector. But we also recognize um, within that transportation sector that there are, there are different paths. So when you look at passenger vehicles in the United States, there's a big push to looking at an electric fleet. And then of course, doing our best to decarbonize um, the electricity sector with the goal of 100% clean electricity by 2035. But 
some of the pieces of the transportation sector are harder to decarbonize. For instance, when we look at aviation, we look at shipping and long haul trucking, these are harder to decarbonize sectors than the passenger vehicles and, and thinking about electrification of the passenger vehicles. When we look at our dependence on coal in the United States, it's primarily power generation. And so when it comes to power generation of both natural gas and coal, we're thinking about this in, in a really responsible way. We're looking at what are existing units that have pollution controls in place, uh, because it's not just about CO2 and methane emissions associated with supply chains, it's also about co-pollutants. And so making sure that we are not just capturing CO2, but that the other acid gases like NOx and SOx, trace metals, particulate matter, that we're really also focusing on co-pollutants to ultimately reduce overall pollution associated with uh, power generation. The other piece that's the responsible view is recognizing that if you have a power plant that's retiring soon, it doesn't, it may not make sense, economically speaking, to retrofit with carbon capture since it's going to be financed over, over decades. And so really looking at committed infrastructure associated with power in the United States. And again, that's where that complexity of natural gas comes in. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, in a bit about the incentives through uh, some of the legislation that's passed in the United States that helps us uh, to, to further the opportunities for that. If you wanna learn more about um, the reorganization that our office underwent uh, over the last year and a half, um, we released a strategic vision in April uh, last spring, and it provides a lot more details. But ultimately what we're doing is, is really shifting such that the investments that we make in R&D are really associated with minimizing environmental and climate impacts of how we produce fossil fuels. So a big part of that is associated with methane quantification and mitigation, uh, but then also how we use fossil fuels. And so again, reducing the pollution um, at the point source. And recognizing too, that it's not just about avoiding carbon emissions from entering the atmosphere to begin with. We also have to recognize that we need to also target the accumulated pool of CO2 in the atmosphere through carbon removal. And carbon removal is a broad portfolio of approaches where direct air capture using chemicals or minerals or even biomass feedstocks is just one approach. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. A thread through everything that we're doing is ensuring that we're advancing justice, uh, considering workforce, and also just engagement. Engagement is a broad category. It can mean um, recognizing that regions that have, for instance, opportunities for geologic storage, but maybe there's not a lot of oil and gas production historically, so there's not a lot of data available. Uh, so there are regions in the United States, for instance, maybe it's Alaska, maybe it's Georgia, different, or maybe it's Hawaii, but recognizing that we need to do more characterization across the United States in terms of these types, different types of formations for geologic storage, and maybe it's saline aquifers, maybe it's depleted oil and gas reservoirs, but maybe it's mineralization as well. And so really making sure that we have communities that have the skills and the, and the expertise to be able to submit robust applications for the dollars that are going out the door. Engagement can also mean community engagement and making sure that there's an understanding of what the technology is that's gonna be deployed ultimately in communities and ensuring that um, there's a transparency in what risks are, but that we also have the tools to mitigate risks and to overcome challenges. Um, and ultimately to ensure that we're reducing air pollution and that we're protecting groundwater. And so there's a lot of different components to engagement. And this is a really significant effort that our office is, is taking on uh, in order to ensure that these technologies can actually move forward without um, the barriers that we've seen historically. And so when we look at um, the funding, and, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail now, uh, all of the carbon management projects that, that we are funding are really advancing equity and justice for communities. In fact, there's four priority areas uh, with dollars that are going out the door. Um, in many cases, the appropriations dollars that are more on the scale of front-end engineering design studies uh, that lead to demonstrations. So at that scale, but also the infrastructure law dollars, which are all really mostly demonstration scale dollars. There's four key components that will make up what's called a community benefits plan. 
Um, one component is that community and stakeholder engagement. Another is the inclusion of diversity, equity, uh, inclusion and accessibility. Uh, Justice 40 initiative. So this is um, what this is, is, is really a program in this administration that started and it's looking at all of the investments that we're making, 40% of those investments leading to benefits to disadvantaged communities. Uh, and so that's Justice 40 initiative. And then finally, quality jobs and making sure that there's a work plan. And if, if you're interested in learning more, uh, we have a lot of these plans that are available online on our website. And if you go to FECM, DOE, and look under the resources tab, you can see uh, we have guidance documents that we, we are providing um, for applicants and submitting each of these components of a community benefits plan. So, and Jared mentioned this too, we're really seeing a lot of increase in activity of carbon capture and storage globally, and also of course in the United States uh, because of the incentives that we have through recently passed legislation. Uh, but when we look at the investments that we made previously in terms of demonstrations, uh, roughly 12 million tons of CO2 permanently stored since 2013, three critical demonstrations, one associated with hydrogen uh, production, and that's in, in Port Arthur, Texas, another associated with carbon capture from a coal-fired power plant, uh, this was also in Texas, and then a third carbon capture at a bioethanol plant, uh, and this is coupled to a class six well, and a class six well is a well that's it's permitted through the Environmental Protection Agency, and it's associated with dedicated storage of CO2, and in this case, a saline aquifer. And so um, those are three demonstration scale projects that collectively um, have stored about 12 million tons of CO2 since 2013. More broadly speaking, the Department of Energy has 20 plus years of research in this space. Uh, a lot of this is, is also focused on the tools to be able to monitor carbon dioxide, its movement in the subsurface, um, to ensure that it's um, not migrating too far uh, and that it's not leaking back out and also that it's not interfering with groundwater. And so really ensuring um, that these processes are safe um, and, and also making sure that we have the tools for the transparency of uh, all of these actions. Uh, also, the key to having these tools is to get ahead of problems. And, and this is all part of some of, the, it, some of the important aspects of the community engagement. And so what we've been doing with Department of Energy, working closely with EPA uh, to be able to coordinate the engagement with communities and, uh, and also making sure that our guidance documents, uh, the work is consistent. And we've also been able to provide technical expertise um, along with our national labs uh, with the, the class six permits um, coupled to EPA as well. And so wanna talk a little bit about the recent legislation that's passed. So two key elements, one is the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so this is providing dollars to build out the capital. The, the Department of Energy broadly has received about 62, will receive $62 billion to spend over the next five years to build out infrastructure for 10 years for clean energy. All of the clean energy goals um, that I outlined at the beginning to achieve net zero greenhouse gases by mid-century. But these investments are just really that first base. In terms of the carbon management equities, there's $12 billion over the next five years. And so that first base, it, that base is really about building out the first of a kind, costly uh, demonstrations. But the key piece is, is it's really just a drop in the bucket. And the key piece is gonna be that the private sector takes those examples, the fact that we're learning by doing, getting down the cost curve, but that's not enough. And so the other key piece is the Inflation Reduction Act, which we're calling IRA at DOE. And, and this is, there's a series of tax credits, um, different policy levers that are in place to help make uh, these different approaches that we're talking about economic so that they, the private sector um, can take it the rest of the way. So again, when we look at the bipartisan infrastructure law, it's really just enough to build out the first of a kind costly. Uh, the, these also, these are projects where the government is paying pretty much 50%, up to 50% to the capital expense. So the Inflation Reduction Act specifically for carbon management, the one key piece that's important is the 45Q federal tax credit. And so this was previously $50 per ton of CO2, and it's been bumped up to $85 per ton 
of CO2 for point source capture. And so the key there is, is that as we look at what we've demonstrated previously, I mentioned three critical projects. We demonstrated post-combustion capture of CO2 from a power plant. We demonstrated CO2 separation from bioethanol. And we also demonstrated CO2 capture from steam methane reforming for hydrogen production. And so those demonstrations, we've learned a lot. We can take those same approaches and also apply them to similar uh, sectors like hydrogen, ethanol, uh, and post-combustion uh, capture of CO2. But we haven't yet demonstrated carbon capture on a natural gas-fired power plant yet. We can learn a lot from the post-combustion uh, data that we have from the Petronova project, but natural gas exhaust is more dilute than a coal-fired power plant. Coal-fired power plant's concentration is roughly between 12 and 15 percent. The exhaust of a natural gas-fired power plant is roughly between 3 and 5 percent. But the same type of technology can be demonstrated for natural gas. But the key is, is to do those demonstrations, to get them off the ground, and also to be transparent about the costs and demonstrate that the technology works ultimately at the end of the day. And so through the bipartisan infrastructure law, those first of a kind demonstrations are gonna be built. The costs will be transparent. The second, the third, and the fourth of a kind, we have the loan programs office at DOE, but we also have the federal tax credit, 45Q, $85 a ton. And there's also um, a significant bump up for direct air capture coupled to dedicated storage, again, a class six well. And this is $180 per ton of CO2. Another important piece is that the minimum project size has been reduced to 1,000 tons for both of these cases. And so that's critical because what it means is not just large units can apply. Uh, it means that many different units, and they're not limited by the scale of their emissions. So over the next five years, $12 billion in the form of grants, loans, credits, in order to really build up uh, this baseline infrastructure. So the expected development is six carbon capture integrated demonstration projects. So what that means is the carbon capture is integrated with the geologic storage and several new small scale pilots. By law, those six carbon capture demonstrations, four are gonna be associated with the power sector, two on coal, two on natural gas, and two that will be industry. Uh, through this funding, we also have four direct, at least four direct air ca capture hubs that will be funded, 100 plus new dedicated CO2 storage wells. And then in terms of pipeline infrastructure in the United States, we have roughly 5,000 miles of CO2 pipeline today, and we're expected to double that uh, through the new um, programs that are associated with building out the transport for, for CO2. We're also looking at not just pipelines, but we're also looking at moving the CO2 by truck, in some cases when the scale is smaller or it's distributed, um, which may be the case for some of the direct air capture uh, opportunities. We're also looking at rail transport and, and of course, uh, freight transport. Wanna also point out the distinction between point source carbon capture and carbon removal. These are two very different tools. Carbon capture is critical for retrofitting existing units to avoid the emissions of CO2 from entering the atmosphere. Carbon removal, a different tool, is seen as, as is really just the tool that's to counterbalance the truly hard to decarbonize sectors today, agriculture, some parts of the aviation sector, shipping, long haul, um, trucking. These are hard to decarbonize sectors today. So carbon removal, even when you look at those scales in the United States, it still adds up to a gigaton. And so we need to be able to scale up carbon removal to the gigatons by mid-century if we're to depend upon it as a tool in our kit to achieving net zero greenhouse gases. And so this is that bottom-up calculation. Again, this is US centric, but looking at those hard to decarbonize sectors, you know, in the United States, we, we emit every year roughly six gigatons of CO2. So when you add up those hard to decarbonize sectors, it's still over a gigaton. And so we're at thousands of tons of removal today. That's six zeros in less than 30 years. So we need to be investing in multiple approaches in parallel, um, because if we don't invest today, we will not get there in time. Wanted to also mention uh, a lot of times it's 
it's it's a little confusing. Direct air capture is energy intensive um, as one of the approaches to, to carbon removal. Um, but there are creative ways that we can think about it. And this is an example where the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management made a number of awards on front-end engineering design studies where direct air capture is coupled to existing utilities. And these are utilities uh, today, like for instance, geothermal and nuclear. Um, and the case of geothermal, when you think about a geothermal power plant, geothermal power plants have a condensing unit to maximize efficiency. The working fluid goes in at one temperature, a higher temperature comes out a lower temperature before it's injected back into the earth. One could envision the direct air capture contactor being the condensing unit, especially for solid sorbent based technologies like the work of uh, like the work of Climeworks, for instance. And so in that case with solid sorbents, you can use the quality of heat can be 100 degrees, maybe even lower. And so if you have a a condensing unit where, or a direct air capture contactor, and your temperature at the inlet is 80 and it comes out at 60, that's a way to regenerate your material in terms of your direct air capture contactor. And so it's not a matter of, it's not a question of am I producing power or am I doing direct air capture? In that creative way, you're actually doing both and you're integrating these systems. Uh, when it comes to nuclear, oftentimes, you know, nuclear, of course, is built to run 24 7. In the grid, there needs to be a flexibility in that the grid may not always need those electrons 24-7. Oftentimes, you see nuclear coupling up to hydrogen production. And so we're trying to also shift a little bit to see if there could be an opportunity to couple stranded electrons, but in this case, steam, um, with direct air capture. And so, so these are companies that are leaning in, working with the direct air capture technologies, and not just producing carbon neutral power, but carbon negative power in these cases. And so it could provide a really interesting tool, a flexible tool for certain regions um, to achieve their net zero greenhouse gas. We also launched the carbon negative shot at COP last year. The key to this is also the recognition that carbon dioxide removal is broader than just direct air capture, and that we have all of these other approaches that are minerals, um, direct ocean capture, uh, which also comes with the benefit if you're using alkalinity as the feedstock can come with the benefit of improving the health of the oceans by reducing ocean acidification. There is improved uh, forest management, increasing the storage of carbon in soils. A lot of these are natural processes that take place and we need to be able to have the tools to quantify what baselines are today and that as we bring additional projects online, how much carbon removal is taking place. We need to be able to have the tools to monitor, to quantify, uh, to do the reporting and, ver and validation of carbon removals really across all of the approaches. And, uh, and once we can get those tools into place, then you could imagine that there could be a tax credit that could subsidize the broad suite of carbon removal approaches, not just direct air capture coupled to geologic storage. And so the aim of our carbon negative shot is to be able to make all of these approaches just as robust and durable as direct air capture coupled to geologic storage. And I'll just end with two more slides that, that gives the overall picture of the bipartisan infrastructure law funding. So I mentioned the direct air capture hubs and, uh, and that's $3.5 billion. There's also prizes, um, uh, roughly $100, $100 million associated with higher TRL, technological readiness level, 15 million, that's lower TRL. And then there's also carbon dioxide utilization and storage, carbon storage validation and testing, $2.5 billion. What we're looking at here, and there's more details in our strategic vision. Um, so by law, each, each one of the sites has to be able to have the capacity to store 50 million tons of CO2. But what we're thinking is with the 2.5 billion is to build out the capacity in the United States on the low end to get to 60 million tons of CO2 injection per year on the high end up to 100 million tons of CO2 injection per year. So building out that capacity, and again, as I mentioned early on, trying to raise up and having it be equitable across the United States, there are different types of rocks in different regions. And so getting that technical expertise and that data available so that we can have opportunities broadly across the United States what that will do is it'll enable more of the carbon capture because then there will be a place for the carbon dioxide to actually go in a permanent way. Um, 
the front end engineering design studies, these are actually feed studies for transportation. So more of the pipeline infrastructure. I, I didn't get a chance to talk about it today, but it, it's part of the legacy impact of fossil and part of the engagement work is recognizing that the good rocks, high quality rocks for storing CO2 are the same rocks that produced oil and gas. And so a lot of those communities are, um, you know, there's resistance to putting CO2 underground because there's been impacts associated with the production of oil and gas and sometimes coal. Uh, and so some of the work that we're doing is, is using unconventional feedstocks in order to produce critical minerals and rare earth elements, for instance, from acid mine drainage, produced water, um, mine tailings. And so this is another program that we're really excited about that will help to address some of the legacy impacts of our dependence on fossil fuels. Finally, the Department of Energy started a new office, the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, under a new Undersecretary for Infrastructure. And, uh, and so here's where you know, the hydrogen hubs funding, the carbon capture, the integrated demos and large pilots that I talked about, and also the CIFIA program, carbon dioxide transportation infrastructure finance and innovative program. And we're working with the loan programs office um, for loans up to $2.1 billion total uh, for building out the transport infrastructure. The hydrogen hubs for at least four of the projects, including one of those projects is, is going to be based on fossil fuels with carbon management. And with that, um, this is a little bit, uh, a few links if you wanna learn more about the work we're doing with justice and engagement, our strategic vision, uh, I encourage you to double click here and take a look. But thanks again for having me and looking forward to our discussion, Jared. Oh, you're on mute. Double mute. <laughs> Double mute. Anyhow, th thank you, Jim, very much for, for, for that presentation and walking us through, um, you know, where the Department of Energy and the, and the U.S. government are, are at in, in terms of your approach to carbon management, the thoughts and the analysis that inform the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management Strategy. It is crystal clear that, as you mentioned, you're thinking about this in a very responsible way, focusing not just on the CO2 but also on co-pollutants, co taking a holistic system view on the committed infrastructure and all the various challenges and complexities that, that come with that you know, large system thinking. So it, it's nice to see the strength of the support that Congress has given you to work with, the combination of the $12 billion to catalyze progress. And then you know, after that, the tax credits that are now available, um, which then can allow the private sector to scale CCS in, in CBR further. So uh, again, appreciate the crystal clear presentation. There's there's clearly much activity on developing CCS hubs and networks that are going around the world, including in the US as, as you gave a highlight. Could you, to start off our, our conversation, provide just some additional thoughts on where do you see the synergies between you know, development of these CCS networks and infrastructure and deployment of, of CDR? And what type of, of broader analysis do you think would help inform how we may all work together to fit these pieces together? Sure. So I, you know, in terms of CCS and CDR, I describe them as two very different tools. Um, there is, you know, in terms of some of the portfolio of carbon removal, like for instance, um, if, if you're coupling bioenergy with carbon capture or direct air capture coupled to dedicated storage, in those cases, that storage component and how you manage the CO2 is the same as how we're doing it with CCS. And I think that, you know, a lot of a lot of those um, storage opportunities are aligned with the oil and gas industry because we have so much expertise and knowledge in that space, and so the mapping of that space to reversing the flow of carbon back underground is going to be critical. But I also recognize that globally, not not everybody has that type of those types of rocks, that type of geology, um, and you know, and we look to Iceland as a great example, for instance, of in situ mineralization and basalts. And you look at regions like Japan, Hawaii, and the United States that have those same types of rocks. And so we need more projects like CarbFix to be able to learn from that. Um, in the United States, we have you know, our different types of um, permits for, for wells. You know, And I think we need to be able to understand what is it gonna take to be able to make sure that we're doing the mineralization work and that that can be permitted as well, just like our class six permits for saline storage or 
or class two permits for enhanced oil recovery. Like we just need to make sure that that's in place and learning from how carb fix is doing it could be a good example um, for us to move forward in that space, but also for other from now to step away from the storage for a moment and think about the ca capture technology. One thing I, I think about is that stepping away from the power sector for a moment and looking at cement, for instance, cement is, is global. And a lot of the countries that have, or a lot of the cement companies that have a presence in the United States, they have a presence internationally in other countries as well. And if we're demonstrating a technology for decarbonizing cement in the United States, we should be able to leverage that technical understanding and learning to be able to do this in an accelerated way in other nations. And I think being really you know, collaborative about what we're learning there is going to be critical. The other piece is now switching back to power. Oh, before I do that, one mention of cement, the other driver you have, we talk about the bipartisan infrastructure law and first of a kind. We talk about the IRA and bumping up a 45Q, wonderful incentives. But how about the market today, the voluntary, the customers that would like to have a low carbon supply chain? you know, for building and construction, whether it's cement, whether it's concrete, steel. And so the other piece that you're doing when you're decarbonizing these sectors is you're, you're supplying that low carbon supply chain that data centers want to be able to, you know, like if it's, you know, and so it's really important to recognize that other lever that you have. With the power sector, that's a little different because it's very regional. You know, it's the consumers and you don't want to, make the consumers have to pay for avoiding the pollution, you know? And so these incentives are so critical to make these approaches economic for the power sector. But the key is, is how do you get something that's commercial and off the shelf economic? You need to do those first of a kind demonstrations. So thank goodness for the bipartisan infrastructure law, we'll have four demonstrations on the power sector. And to me, it's like, again, those technologies, ultimately those chemical companies, that are allowing and enabling that decarbonization of the power sector, we can learn from that so that other nations that are going to be continuing to depend on fossil fuels, maybe in a bigger and a greater way for longer, can adopt those approaches because we paid first, you know, for those first of a kind expensive. And so I'm hopeful that through collaborative work internationally that we can really Move, move the ball forward faster. Yeah, that, that, that sounds great. And, and again, that's a big part of what I did when I was there at Department of Energy and in my yes. current role here at the Institute. And, you know, I, I know it's it's an exciting time here and it's a, it's a busy time, right? DOE recently hosted the, the Global Clean Energy Action Forum in Pittsburgh and, you know, several thousand participants from a number of countries all across the, the, the low carbon and, and climate mitigation space. Next week, you and I will both be at the IEA Greenhouse Gas Technology Conference focused on CCS with well over a thousand of the world's CCS technical experts. And then the COP is, is fast approaching as well. Well, right. And so lots of various mechanisms for all the governments and government and private sector to to collaborate, you know, to to advance all of these technologies from from your perspective and maybe leveraging what you just mentioned in terms of not just the opportunity, but the need for all of us to work together and to leverage investments in country A to help accelerate um, progress in, in countries B and C and D. Where, where do you see the most need and still the most opportunity for that international collaboration and maybe two ways. One, at a technical level, how can we best cooperate and collaborate technically to continue to advance these technologies? And then two, if you take a step back at a policy level, where do you see you know, the, the most exciting opportunities there to sort of share lessons learned of policies to help support and advance CCS and CDR? Sure. I mean, I think from a technical perspective, it would be, it would be really good for us to be able to collect the data, you know, and, um, and leverage universities and researchers. Um, you mentioned the carbon dioxide removal primer, you know, um, it is available, but now it's available in hard copy too. And, um, and there's a chapter that we have in there that's, you know, all bringing data together. So data, if you think about direct air capture, what do you need? You know, you're going to need a place to put the CO2 uh, so maybe co-locating with geologic storage opportunities, or at least co-locating with a, a conversion process that permanently stores it in a synthetic aggregate, you know, whatever it might be. But you also need low carbon energy, 
And that low carbon energy needs to also be prioritized. If you have a, a region that needs energy and, and you know clean electricity, for instance, you don't want to do direct air capture in place of providing clean, and that's part of the equity question too, is making sure that everybody has access to energy, but not just not, not polluting energy, making sure that it's clean. And so you have to think about prioritizing the limited resources that we have, whether it's low carbon energy, water, land. And it's important that we, before siting, we have to understand what that data looks like. And and in every region, there's something to offer when it comes to carbon dioxide removal. But those maps that we created are, are, are not complete. And that's because, you know, there's, there's of course, language barriers. Um, but the reality is, is most, most uh, countries have universities and colleges and, and there's geology programs and there's chemistry programs. And it's, I think, really important to try and get that data in a way that's open access, that's available globally. So that we can actually, if we have a project in the United States and we're matching a certain geology with a certain low carbon energy and we, we say, wow, this is a great place to site direct air capture. Where do those synergies also exist globally? And how can we accelerate that project and do a hundred of them globally like it? You know, and, and it's like, it's just bringing the data together. We need more data, more transparency, more global mapping. I, I think that's a critical area. And, and I think that is technical. Now on the... On the broader side of policy and what we could potentially do and what, what can we share to be able to improve impact, I think really thinking about standardization across the approaches. Um, so I'm thinking again more on the carbon removal side of things. As we look at there's nature-based approaches to removing carbon, uh, we need to accelerate some of those nature-based, not not oceans, obviously, because I mean, the oceans have been taking up a lot of CO2 at the expense of, the, of their health. But we need to make sure, number one, forests continue to be robust sinks in that we are managing them in a way that they can actually increase how much carbon they take in. Um, we need to, you know, but the key is, is like the standardization, like what are the tools that we have in a standardized way to be able to quantify you know, what we're doing in terms of carbon removal. And if we could standardize that, then you could imagine nations that have a very small carbon emissions footprint, but have a lot of value when it comes to carbon removal, that that could be worth something. You know, there are nations that have a large footprint and nowhere to put the carbon. And so there could be, you know, something that we could imagine in the future where there's value to being able to provide carbon removal you know, um, at a cost that others would be able to purchase to help counterbalance, you know, something that's difficult for them to avoid. Yeah, no, I think working together toward that standardization, toward the fungibility of carbon offsets and carbon removals and carbon mitigation globally is something that would obviously make make it all, you know, more efficient for, for all of us. And, you know, it looks like a, a necessary part of that, that, that solution set going forward. So, well, and just to add to that, because I see, I can see some of the questions in the, yeah. the Q&A. And to add to that, this goes to justice considerations as well, because, when you think about some of the carbon removal options, you could start with, well, what have the legacy impacts been previously? You know, or um, you, you can look at how is this project actually gonna achieve benefits to a community? How is it gonna restore an ecosystem? How is it going to, you know, building trees that are drought resistant, you know, improving agricultural practices that store carbon, but re remove the need for additional fertilizer? You know, there are so many ecosystem benefits that we can envision that you could start there um, and, and really, really communicate first, listen to a community and find out what the needs are, find yeah. out what legacy impacts are, um, and then start to achieve those benefits. Uh, so, I mean, that is one of the examples of, of how one could be successful at some of the justice considerations. Oh, I understand and agree. And I think in your presentation, you, you know, you mentioned that, uh, uh, a common thread through all that you are doing is in you know advancing environmental justice as we advance the technologies and the deployment and and you know work toward mitigating climate change and you know you mentioned that you know part of the calculus and the strategy is ensuring that all the communities benefit as we move toward that sustainable future and I know that's a that's a a large part of the Biden administration approach to addressing climate change mitigation broadly 
I, I had a question in terms of if you could comment further on, you know, how CCS and CDR can can enable that broad decarbonization and help the environmental justice. If you've got some examples of, you know, how you can get that twofer or that synergy, there was a question that I saw came in from the audience in terms of, you know, are there some positive examples of community engagement with respect to environmental justice? And what's interesting is because we're all talking about equity and, and, and you know, social equity and, and, and social justice, environmental justice, all, all combined together. Another question that came in that may be a fun one for you is, as a scientist, how do you define equity um, in, in relation to CCS. So maybe if, however you want to respond to the, this, you know, general topic of equity and, and how, how one engages with community to make sure we do find that appropriate balance as we move. Yeah, so I'll start with the community one. Um, so with the community, I mean, I, I'll just give, you know, two examples. You could imagine, so what we're seeing, you know, in the engagement uh, that we're doing is that there's a lot of conflation between carbon dioxide removal and carbon capture. And carbon capture is often, just often it's easy to put it in a box and say that that box, that carbon capture enables fossil. And so those communities that just don't want fossil don't want carbon capture because they're together in that box. And that's why we're trying to untangle that a little bit first to just say carbon capture is a, it's actually a, a broader tool um, yeah, sometimes it enables fossil, which is why we have to go back to, let's make sure everybody has access to energy. Let's make sure that energy is reliable. Let's make sure the energy is clean and why we have an office that's focused on methane quantification and mitigation because that upstream, that, that upstream supply chain is critical as well. Uh, because recognizing CCS on a natural gas plant means more natural gas out of the ground to, to go to that plant. So you've got to really think about the entire supply chain. And it's not the fossil and the power that's bad. It's not that we turn our lights off and go without. It's that we have tools. They have not been incentivized in the past. They have not been economic for industry to adopt. We're in a position now through the bipartisan infrastructure law to build out the capital. We've got the policy incentives in place to make them economic. So we have an opportunity, a once in a life opportunity right now to clean it up so that folks have access. Um, but the reality is there's that history and there's that box and that's how it is coined. And we are trying to untangle it, but that is the reality. And so if we go into a community that feels very strongly in that way, and here we are saying, yeah, but the CO2, we got to manage it. We're going to put it back into the rocks, you know? And if they say no, you know, when we look at the community benefits plan of our broader application, it's 20% of the grade. And so if a community is pushing back on it and you're an applicant and you're a developer and you're trying to build out that community benefits plan and you're not getting any traction, probably the, there's going to be a, a, some veto power there. You know, If the community doesn't want it in this administration, it's in, in one of those six projects, it's not going to go there. You know, And so there's, there's one clear example of just like, you don't want it, we'll move on. You know? Yeah. Um, a positive example, though, I mean, because I think that that's unfortunate, you know, and I think a positive example would be take direct air capture, for instance, and recognize, and this is in chapter three of my textbook that I wrote 10 years ago, um, it's chemistry. CO2 and reactions with amines is chemistry, and, and, and it's acid-based chemistry. Sulfur oxides, SO3, SO2, are stronger acids than CO2. NO, NO2, stronger acids than CO2. They compete. And if it's amines, they can even form heat-stable salts that make it unable for carbon to be captured. So what that means is if you are a technology, carbon capture, and you're, you're putting it in an area, you're not just reducing the pollution of CO2. You've got to actually do what's called a polishing step and reduce the NOx and the SOx, and you've got to do air filtration and get rid of the particulate matter, just like our catalytic converter does in our automobile. It wouldn't be able to turn CO to CO2 if it didn't capture the particulate matter too. And so we are not just cleaning the air of CO2, we're cleaning it of other things too. And so some of the work that we're doing to be transparent about that is what are the baseline pollution you know, what's the baseline pollution? And as we do carbon capture, how is the other, co how are the other co-pollutants coming down? Yeah. 
that we're not just capturing CO2, we're reducing the pollution. Put it near ports, put it near highways. And so there's significant co-benefits to direct air capture. And so just trying to untangle the conflation between all of these things is, is critical. So those are a couple of examples. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, as, as part of the global CCS community, um, we've just scratched the surface in terms of how do we identify and analyze and then communicate what those cool benefits are, as you just gave a couple of examples, right, of how can we, this is clearly a technology enabled solution, right, to balance our environmental footprint, climate change mitigation with providing energy and energy services. It's only been several years where globally we've gone down to less than, you know, a billion people that don't have access to modern, you know, energy services that, that we all appreciate here. And so how we balance this together, how we can find synergies of, of a Again, how we deploy these technologies, how they all work together, absolutely critical. And, and again, I really, really uh, appreciate hearing from you in terms of the, the DOEs and the U.S. government's leading role in this area. Seen a lot, you know, we've got a couple of minutes left here. Um, a lot of progress. You've got $12 billion to work with now. There's a great new IRA law that will help support all forms of, of low carbon technology deployment in the states. And you talked about how you can leverage that, you know, globally working with partners uh, as, as we proceed. A final question, though, there's there's got to be some pitch points, some barriers, right? It's it's not all roses, right? There's still many challenges going forward. And so just in a minute or two, from your perspective, could you just just for for folks awareness, uh, just provide a high level overview of what what's still on the critical path? What are the key issues that you and your colleagues are working on and addressing um, that we'll need to find a way to work together to overcome um, to get this to where we want it to go? You know, I, I think of this question as what are the barriers, yeah. you know? And this is a, a standard catalysis problem, right? And it's like, and I can't help it because we're both chemical engineers, um, but it's like, what are the barriers? And and how do you, you know, in catalysis, you know, you either, you find a different path over the mountain, you know, one that's shorter has, you know, and so I think there's a lot of ways to get to where we want to go, um, but we don't have time, you know, and we're out of time. And I think one of the critical barriers is what we've been talking about, and that's the engagement piece. And I think it's what would be great is if we had more opportunities for education. Um, you know, I, I'm envisioning like an ambassador program, you know, where it's like you get local stakeholders that are trusted by the communities um, that we can help to have the facts, the facts about carbon capture technologies, the facts about the monitoring and the tools that we've been investing in for 20 years and using and depending for these projects that you, you outlined in your introduction at the beginning, um, facts about carbon dioxide removal, just really facts based on science, you know, and grounded in science and having that messaging be consistent and, and recognizing that every region is different. Every region is going to have a different set of concerns. And can we try to bucket some of those concerns and have consistent messaging um, to those communities, because that's a lot of the barrier that I'm seeing. And oftentimes it's not even grounded in science. And it's, and it's, it's as an educator, as a professor, uh, it's, it's, it's disheartening. And I just feel like we need more. We need more education. We need more people. We need, uh, so that's to me, one of the biggest challenges right now. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's a great, you know, summary to, to end our conversation on. We're coming up right on the hour, but again, clearly an opportunity for all of us to continue to work together uh, to do exactly what you just mentioned, right, to get us from where we are to where we want to be, um, and, and, and clearly a technology-enabled path where CCS and CDR um, are, uh, are an essential part of that solution. So um, with, with that, I think for, for in the interest of time, we're going to have to call that a day. Jen, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to have this conversation with, with you here today. Just a quick note for, for all the folks in the audience, OGCI's next webinar will look at um, work in the UK, the East Coast cluster in the UK and its role in industrial decarbonization. OGCI have Andy Lane who runs the cluster and uh, Philip Aldridge who represents the chemical industry in the regional conversation there. They're working on an exact date um, for the next, next webinar under this series. Um, but as soon as they, they nail that down, invites will go out soon. So keep an eye open uh, on your inbox. Um, and with that, again, thank you very much, Dr. Jen Wilcox, um, for your you. presentation. Thank everybody for your, your time and participation with us here today. And uh, stay healthy uh, and goodbye for now. Take care.